is to start the beginning and watch the money. Let's go like we the land.
Hey, how's it going? Oh, okay. Hey, how are you today? Mm. Hi. We'll wait. Hey, we'll wait a bit longer until uh, um, seven o'clock because I think other people might join. Okay, sounds good. How has your day been today? Uh, it was good. It's good. Um, yeah, just um, dealing with some um, Git issues at work, like uh, branches, Git, all that. Yeah. So. Okay. So, what, are you in banking or finance? Uh, no, uh, digital marketing. Digital marketing. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. You yeah. guys must do some interesting things in it. I've yeah, I've been looking at affiliate marketing lately. Okay. We we deal with uh, uh like you know getting stuff from Google, Bing, uh, Facebook. Uh, you know uh, when people interact with, uh, for, for then people interact with a company's Facebook page or a company's, uh, you know, uh, or when people look for directions on Google, Google collects all these metrics, and then you get it from Google and you can you know play with it and then you can display it to people on dashboards and uh, yeah. So that's what we do. It's, okay, that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, do you create your own software? Yes, we do. We create, we're mostly just all like web-based. Uh, you know, we have our um, end customers, like our big companies will see, um, you know, dashboards where they can know uh, like what, you know, how people are interacting. Like suppose like uh, State Farm has like, you know, 50,000 locations over the whole U.S. and uh, or Right. So for each one location, like how many people are asking for directions to that state farm, how many people are calling state farm, they can collect all this, aggregate the data and show it in one dashboard for the nationwide for state farm, for example. Oh, okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, Ed, Ed Gould. Hello. How are you today? Good. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Oh, cool. Good, how are you? I'm pretty good. How was your day? Oh, uh, it was all right. Do Not anything interesting? Anything interesting? No, we're just uh, grinding through, uh, getting close to a release on the product that I work on. So we're lots of uh, little tiny bugs and sorting out in a, or like a front end, front end application. Oh, okay, cool. What, what's the application or what type of company do you work for? It's, uh, it's a VPN. A VPN? Yeah. Oh really? So um, yeah, I work on the I work on the desktop, uh, the desktop software. Okay, so you actually build out a VPN software for um, accessing a network, like uh, for like uh, um, secure. So it's more problem. it's less it's more um, like a personal <laughs> use kind of thing. Sorry, I'm just gonna change oh, okay. my, um, audio here. Uh, it's more personal use kind of thing. So it's a lot of um, a lot of people who are just looking for unlocking content via geo geo restrictions and stuff like that. Oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, not like a commercial VPN. Oh, okay. Yeah. What uh, What do you do? Um, I'm a web developer. Oh yeah. Uh, so at the moment, I'm trying to start up a bootcamp, but uh, I'm also doing these meetups and stuff. So, um, yeah, I'll get into that in a moment. And I'm also doing security courses at the moment, like uh, cybersecurity. So I have a CEH. So okay. I do pen testing and stuff like that. Where do you study? Um, I'm doing it online at Eddie Rica, right? Uh -huh. uh, but uh, I went to school at the University of Ottawa. So that's my degree. My first degree was computer engineering, hmm. right? Uh, then I've worked in everything from digital hardware design, databases. I was a technical analyst at the bank. Uh, creating dashboards, much like uh, uh, the fellow that I was just speaking to. And then I uh, worked at uh, insurance companies and other stuff. So now I wanted to start up this bootcamp. 
so I took a little bit of time off. Cool. Yeah. So you're largely working with um, like web, web tech? Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know if you know David's T. I actually worked on the platform uh, behind that at one point. That was like 10 years ago, I think. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, I think they're still using it. Um, and other websites that are used internally in a lot of organizations. So, um, as well as databases. I'm not sure if you're aware of what data warehouses are, but uh, I I've worked with those as well. Is that, uh, is that kind of like a data engineering kind of thing or? Um, database engineering, because as data grows, uh, like data is power, you know what I mean? If you know how to utilize it, um, it's great. But in order to utilize it, sometimes you need to uh, build certain things to hold it. So you, can, you, you could uh, create reports on it uh, without causing complex reports, I mean without causing issues for your front end applications. So what they do is they take the information from websites, different websites and applications and combine it uh, so that you can generate reports on it real time. And uh, that's basically what a data warehouse is. It's basically for tracking all the business processes and stuff in your organization by uh, combining the relevant information that you wanna use for analysis. Did that make sense or was it too? So is that sort of um, the so the technical role being sort of somewhere in between like a DBA and the physical database? Uh, I'd say it's um, a combination of roles. It's called a business intelligence mm -hmm. uh, analyst. So basically, you build the databases, you uh, clean the data and pull it in, as well as generate the reports. So you do all of that, but there's programs that make it a lot easier than having to actually uh, do too much coding for it with it. So it minimizes it. Well, sort of minimizes it. It's more SQL based rather than like uh, dealing with C sharp and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. It sounds, a little, it sounds a little bit like data, sort of like the deeper end of like data engineering. Uh, yeah. They have different terms for a lot of roles. Uh, so the same role at different companies could have different names. Uh, that's what I've noticed. So it's, I'd say it's very similar to data engineering. Mm. All right, so I, I guess we can get started. Um, so I saw this quote from Albert Einstein, imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited, but imagination encircles the world. So when you, during your career and anything you uh, um, venture on, never forget to use your imagination to the limit. All right. All right, so I have a YouTube channel. I posted it on the meetup groups and there's also a Facebook group in case meetup. Uh, I sometimes have trouble posting updates to meetup at certain times of the day. So I'll also post the meetups and updates on the group, uh, on the Facebook group. Uh, on the Fresh Code Soda YouTube channel, I'll post recordings of this current meetup as well as tutorials in case you wanna go more depth into the topics that are covered because since we're covering all this in a single hour, uh, there's limited material that we'll be able to go over. And I'm trying to keep it simple so that uh, you won't get confused, even though I'm sure you're capable of grasping everything. All right, so what is this group about? So this group was created for knowledge sharing and the avenue for people interested in technology to do hands-on exercises and get tutorship in anything technical. This includes hardware, software, security, and more. And there are different meetups online that, we'll, that we've done in the past and we will be doing on the future that will cover these topics and introduce you to them in a way that you can understand them. Uh, also, we'll be providing an avenue for networking amongst professionals and companies in the future. We'll be having live meetups later on as the group grows and double ups. Uh, feel free if you'd like to re give a presentation on anything or hear, learn about anything. And then I could uh, find someone that would uh, introduce you to the topic and have them give a presentation. So who am I? I finished a degree in computer engineering over 15 years ago. I've worked in everything from digital hardware design, databases and web design. And I've seen things change over the years because things have changed a lot. Um, 
more than you can imagine. Uh, I've worked in insurance, gaming, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, and hospitality for both big and small companies, older companies that have been around for a long time, as well as startups. I've worked with several frameworks and languages in a professional as well as academic setting uh, at different levels as well. This include uh, BHDL, Assembly, C, C Sharp, Java, PHP, WordPress, uh, most recently .NET and .NET Core, web forms and more. I got a bunch of certifications. Uh, my hobbies are currently weight training, traveling, movies, reading, and uh, writing and eating. I write books. Below are two links to some two books I post. I uh, have published on Amazon. If you want to give it a look, the Kindle editions are free. And so let's start our introduction to .NET course. Um, there will be minimal coding in this uh, tutorial and uh, follow along. Hopefully you guys got Visual Studio's community installed so that you'll be able to follow on. It, it's relatively simple. So first, before we get into the coding, uh, what is .NET Core? Well, .NET Core is a Microsoft framework. It is a rebuild of the .NET framework created by Microsoft and dispersion is faster and takes up less space. It is also free. What is a framework? Well, a framework is basically a bunch of pre-built code and functionality that you can leverage in order to build things out faster. So what is .NET Core MVC, which is what we're gonna be learning today? Well, MVC is a coding design pattern. It's a way of writing your code and it stands for Model View Controller. And it's commonly used for web development. And today we'll be building a simple web application that follows this. It allows the separation of code into different layers and groupings. Uh, models are code used to represent the structure of data. Views are code for what you view in your browser. And controllers are used for processing of the data and information that you get from your views and your models. If this doesn't make sense, it will when we start building because you're gonna actually see the structure of the code which Visual Studios kindly generates for us, and it's what we're using today. So why .NET Core MVC? It's fast to build with, it's free, it's easier to use than a lot of uh, the other existing um, things out there. It is well-structured, and it's good for building out websites and teams because of how the code is separated out. So you won't be working on the same file at the same time because you don't need to. Furthermore, it can run on multiple operating systems. Previously, .NET was best run on Windows servers. Now it could run on different operating systems like Linux, um, as well as Windows. Why use the Visual Studios IDE? So I told you guys to download Visual Studios community. Uh, it's because it does a lot of the work for us. It is highly configurable. Something a lot of people don't know is that you can actually write modules that'll modify um, and add operations that you can automate into Visual Studios. So you can actually modify the integrated development environment, the thing you use to code in. And it has tons of supporting tools that are already pre-built that you can add on. So as I mentioned before, we're going to be creating a .NET Core MVC web application today. However, there are other web app design patterns that you can create with Visual Studios that are automatically uh, that a template is used to automatically generate the body for you. Um, and though we won't be delving too much into it, I thought I'd give them a mention. So there's the MVC framework, which stands for Model View Controller, which we'll be doing today. The REST framework, Blazor, which is Microsoft's newest framework, WebForms, uh, Razor, and ASP. So why code a website when you can use WordPress, Wix, or something else that does it for you. My thoughts as a 2020, and this might change, I think WordPress is great. In fact, I personally use it and have used it in a lot of the projects that I've done for small clients. Uh, it offers quick out of the box solutions because a lot of stuff's already pre-built and you could accomplish with it what you need quickly in both uh, for both external and internal applications. You don't have to know much to use it. Uh, this is why it's 30% of the websites on the web currently use it because it's fast and cheap to build with. However, there are drawbacks currently to this particular framework and many others that generate the code for you. 
uh, firstly, it's not good for dealing with large amounts of data. What you'll realize is that as the amount of information that you just store in a web application grows, uh, the web application starts behaving funny if it's not built um, according to certain rules. Uh, furthermore, it's not good for sites that will scale to several thousands of recurring consistent users uh, that use it on a constant basis um, based on what I've seen. Uh, this might change in the future, but that's how it is at the moment. Because you have to remember that the web development and coding industry and the IT industry changes every single day and uh, faster than any other profession out there possibly. And so you have to continuously learn and there's new things being created to solve old problems. And um, finally, the last thing I sort of think is an issue with WordPress is that for higher functionality, they charge you additional amounts in order to purchase that functionality unless you build it yourself. Uh, so for some additional features in these uh, easy to use systems, you'll have to pay for additional things. But that's okay, because oftentimes they don't charge you that much. So it's, also, it's always worth a look, because you never want to rebuild the wheel. So let's get back to .NET Core MVC, because that's what we're going to be uh, dealing with today. And uh, the languages we're going to be using in the model will be C Sharp, which is something called the object-oriented programming language. Don't worry if you don't understand uh, what object-oriented means right now, because we're not going to be doing much coding, because uh, a lot of it's generated for us. Uh, in the view, we'll be using Razor, which is basically C Sharp code that we can run on our HTML pages. And HTML is the language of the web that most websites are built in on the front end. Right? And that's what you go and see, JavaScript and CSS. And in the controller, we're going to be using C Sharp and Link. Link is a language used to interact with databases through C Sharp. So I already mentioned what Razor is. And let's get started. So in your, um, in Windows, open up Visual Studios 2019, and we're gonna create a new project. In the create new project uh, screen, scroll down and select ASP.NET Core web application. Make sure it's ASP.NET Core and not ASP.NET because remember they're different versions of uh, the ASP.NET framework and uh, the different versions tend to behave and be slightly structured differently. So it might cause confusion. Once you have chosen ASP.NET Core web application, click next. So we're gonna create a new project and we're gonna call this um, Meetup Learning App and then press create. Visual Studios will bring us to this new screen and make sure you have web application model view controller selected as well as at the top .NET Core and ASP.NET Core 3.1 selected. So there's something about uh, the .NET frameworks you should know. The version number, uh, the main number after .NET Core like two or three signifies a change in standards for the actual framework. So that means uh, the framework uh, code that's generated might be structured differently or there might be uh, differences in functionalities and the way things are uh, uh, used from version to version. Uh, just so you're aware. That's why you should make sure that you're using ASP.NET Core 3.1. Next, what we're going to do is go to Authentication and click Change. So we want to create a web application that has a login and register um, functionality set up for us. So we'll click Individual User Accounts and Store User Accounts in App. What this will do is use something called Identity Framework, which is a framework that uh, makes our life easier uh, by giving us this functionality out of the box. There are also other options like work or school accounts or uh, Windows authentication. And the strengths of those is 
of those is that you can use um, other applications that are used to manage uh, user uh, accounts uh, on an organization scale in order to in order to uh, um, uh, control the user's privileges and stuff. But today we'll be using it individual user accounts. And then click OK. And then click Create. So what Visual Studios is doing now is generating the code for us. And boom, as you can see here, by looking at the Solution Explorer, we can see all our files, uh, a bunch of files have already been created. And what this is, is basically the structure or a template for our website. So if we were to press play here, this website would automatically start up and show us what Visual Studios has built for us. And boom, we have a website already built, which allows us to log in and register new users. So to take a look at what happens when we create a new account, let's create a new test account and enter in a password. Your password can be whatever you want. And then click register. And something interesting happens. It says a database operation failed while processing the request. So we have to apply the we have to apply the migrations in order to. Uh, so we had to apply the operations in order to uh, uh, create our database. So we had to apply the migrations. So what this will do is automatically set up the backend for us to log in and register and persist that information. We'll get into that a little bit more in, the, in a while. Now we refresh the page. Okay, so now we can actually register. Uh, as you can see, the user is uh, registered, but the actual email confirmation hasn't been set up. So we had to click here to confirm our account and our account has been set up. So now we have the ability to log into our web application. Boom. Okay, so out of the box, just by selecting the option to create a uh, login um, individual accounts, Visual Studios automatically created a login and register functionality for us. If it didn't, that could have been a lot of work. So that's one. Uh, this is one example of how it could speed it up, but that is not all. It doesn't stop there. So let me show you some more things. So let's go to Visual Studios and stop our web application and start writing a little bit of code. So the first thing we're going to do is go to our models. And what we're going to build today is a note-taking app. So we're gonna build an app that uh, allows us to write notes and save them. So the first thing we wanna do is create a class in our models folder, which is called notes. As you recall, I mentioned how uh, we're using the MVC uh, architecture. So let's take a moment before we continue in order to uh, take a tour of what was set up for us. So in the folder, we have views. And if you recall what we just saw, we saw a website which had welcome and learn about building web, web apps with ASP.NET Core. So if we go into our home and index.cshtml, we'll see the code behind this. So we see learn about building web applications with ASP.NET Core. So that's the code behind this particular website, which simplifies things for us. So the views folder contains all the information for all the websites 
organized by folder uh, for what we'll see when we're visiting um, a particular page. The controller is basically all the processing. So whenever there's, we want a particular information to be passed from the front end uh, and have any operations done on it, it would happen in the controller, which is where business operations and things like calculations would occur. And then the models are what structure our data. And we're gonna, and this is a reflection of our database. So we'll create the following two attributes to structure our data and represent the data we're gonna be storing. String, title, Okay, so we're gonna be having notes. And each of those notes will have the following attributes. It's going to have a title and a description. So whenever we enter a note, we're gonna want uh, input that will allow us to enter in a title and a description. So in order to automatically generate that functionality via Visual Studios, we'll right click and click add on the controllers folder. If you recall, this is where we add the functionality for doing anything, uh, any processing and click add controller. Next, we're gonna create an MVC controller with views using entity framework. An entity framework is a library That'll, that basically takes care of all database interactions and saving and persisting and storing of information for us. So we click add. And from our model classes in the window that pops up, we're gonna select note. And then from the data, data context class, we're gonna select data application DB context. And then we're going to click add. And incredibly, what this does is going to automatically generate the pages we need to store information for notes without us having to lift a finger. So all we did was write about three lines of code and the rest of the code will be generated for us for this particular task, which has cut down our the amount of work and amount of coding that we'd have to do immensely. So let's press uh, play first and see what has happened and what has changed. As you can see on this page, we don't have the functionality to view notes. That's because we didn't create a link to the notes uh, page by altering the main page HTML or the main page views. So what we'll have to do here is go navigate to it via URL and I'm adding notes slash index here and then pressing enter. And look, it's, it's saying, uh, giving us an error. And this is because when we added in our model, we forgot to update the database. So in order to update the database um, or inform entity framework that we've made a change, every time you make a change or add a new model and generate the controller for it, you have to add something called a migration. So you'll type in your package manager console, add migration, and that'll be notes. What this will do is automatically generate the code for us. And then we say update database. So it automatically generated the code for um, storing the information. And now we're updating the actual database uh, with this code. And now we'll be able to actually uh, uh, add, view, and edit notes. So as you can see, we have a new page in the notes uh, slash index uh, subdirectory. And here we can click create new, enter in a title, and enter in a description. And the note is magically created for us. We create a new note. 
note two and description two. And we have another note automatically created for us. We can delete it and it asks us if you want to delete it. And all this has been created for us, with us without us doing anything. We could view the details and it shows us the information that is stored in that note. And all we did was about three steps. And already we have an application that uh, does a lot of things that we would um, need an application to do in a data context. It's already a useful application. However, there are some things missing. And since we have, um, it's only 725, we have about a half an hour, so we can add onto that functionality. So the first thing I'm going to change is make it so that only logged in users can view the notes. In order to do this, we'd have to go to our notes controller and just type in the following. At the top of the notes controller, we type in authorize this keyword and then press control period. And what this does is automatically make it so that only users that have been logged into the application can view notes, edit notes, or delete notes. You might be wondering, what does the notes con what is the purpose of the notes controller? Uh, well, the notes controller, if you recall, um, contains all the operations uh, for editing, viewing details, and deleting. Uh, that uh, the, the view we interact with performs. So if you recall before, let's look a little bit closer at it. We have a notes controller. And then when we go to the index URL, we have something called, we have an action or a method, this is what it's called, called index. And then by default, it's mapped to the view, the notes folder, because it shares the common naming structure of notes with the notes folder. And then there's an the index.chhtml. And this is automatically linked by a coding convention. This is just Visual Studio's nose that whenever you call the index URL to pull up um, that particular view. Does that make sense? Uh, stop me, if, speak up if something's confusing me. Any questions? I'll take a minute to, uh, um, before continuing. Is everyone clear on that? If you're confused or um, anything's unclear, just ask. I have a question. Okay, go for it. Yeah, so the notes controller is basically um, is it just something that Entity Framework created for you? Is that? Uh, so this was created by Visual Studios. So what it did is um, Entity Framework is a framework for interacting with the database. It's basically a library. Right. Uh, so, so I said I said it a little incorrectly that Entity Framework created it, but but it seems like this is all Entity Framework related code in the Notes controller. Um, yes. So right over here. There are certain operations that Entity Framework um, allows us to use in order to interact with the database. So for example, whenever we're interacting with the database, we use something called an application DB context. So Entity Framework basically allows us to access the actual underlying database, which is a different application altogether that's running in the background separate from Visual Studios, even though it's, it sets it up for us. Um, and via Entity Framework and its unique operations like context.add, and we pass in the data, and context.save changes, it's updating the database. So this is not all Entity Framework co uh, code. Uh, some of the operations, so each library uh, that you use provides certain functionality. And in this case, Entity Framework provided us with the ability to use the context 
uh, and use operations like add and save changes async. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes more sense. Uh, where where are these, which database are, because I didn't see you set up SQL Server or anything. Where, which uh, database? So what happened is that it automatically generated a database for us. So it's a development database. If you look in the following file, appsettings.json, there is a connection string, which points to the database. The oh, okay. automatically generated database is actually in a temporary folder on your computer in a folder called app data, but in the different versions of .NET framework. And as they've gone along, they've actually changed the location. I remember in older versions of .NET, it would actually be created in the project. So you'd be able to see it in uh, um, the data folder, but they've changed it so that it's in the um, app data folder. So you won't be able to see it through the Explorer. But if you do want to access it, you have the SQL Server Object Explorer. And from here, you should be able to uh, um, uh, see it. And right here it is for me. So I can see my database. Okay, thank you, that makes sense. Okay, uh, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, if not, we'll continue. So by adding authorize, we made it so that uh, so since the notes controller is basically uh, doing all the processing and saying and for create operations, as well as telling when a user accesses a web page, it uh, returns the information for the view. By adding the authorize at the top, any operations related to notes will be uh, requiring that the user is logged in. So let's take a look at that right now. Uh, just a quick, another quick, just short question on this authorized. Why, why didn't you put the authorized on the home controller? Why, how, what, and what if, um, let's say you have a home controller and I actually failed authentication, will I get an error message on the screen? Or, um, so, two questions. Basi yeah. So basically, with the home controller, uh, the home controller provides the functionality for returning the following pages. The home page, the main page we go to when we visit the actual website, okay. as well as the privacy page. So if we were to look at the home controller and the code within it, we'll see there are two actions, index and privacy, and they return a view. And then if we look at the actual views folder, and look at the home uh, folder, uh, we'll see there are two files, index and privacy. So these are two unprotected pages. So um, the way it's set up now, and this might change based on the application, but there will always be pages you want the user to be able to access even though they're not logged in, and pages you don't want them to be accessed uh, if they aren't logged in. Um, so by not adding to the home controller authorize, what this allows us to do is see this even when we're not logged in. And, and if you were to go to the notes uh, endpoint uh, without logging in, you should, you'll probably get some error built in error message. Well, that's what's interesting. So now it's automatically gonna redirect us to the login page. So it does all of that for us. Okay, because got it, the got authorize, it because the authorize is built into identity framework. That's the identity framework functionality. So it actually does the work for us, right? So you see there's Microsoft ASP.NET Core authorization. Thank you. On a side, on a side note, even though I put this, um, this restriction on a controller basis, it doesn't have to be on top of the controller. You could put it on particular actions. So if I wanted it, them to only be able to access, not be able to access the details page if they are uh, not logged in, I would put the authorize here instead. So it's a very powerful tool, an annotation that simplifies our lives for us. So as you can see, I cannot access the notes page, but when I log in, Uh, 
Um, now I can, and it automatically generates, it sends me back to the page I was trying to access initially. So now, as the next step, what we want to do is make it so that rather than having to type in the notes location in the URL, we want to be able to access it by clicking a link to it. So in order to do that, we go to the shared folder in views and the layout.cshtml folder file. And then all we have to do here is add another link because the layout.cshtml is basically a code that is shared between all the pages. So it's like a external wrapper to the pages that includes our menus. So in here, we would specify the ASP controller that is for our note, specify the action we want to direct it to, which is index, and we'd say this is notes. And now suddenly we have the ability to access our notes page by clicking on the actual notes link, which magically showed up at the top. Note, oh, it's notes, not note. So the spelling is important. Okay. And then there we go. So that should, unfortunately we had to stop it and restart it in order for those changes to take place. But there are, there are actual tools that will automatically restart it whenever you make a change. Uh, I don't have it installed. So I click on notes and it takes me to the notes page. But there is a problem currently uh, based on the application we created because we want the notes to only be able to see the notes that we created. But if I was to create a new user, whoops, if I was to create a new user, I would also be able to see the notes that any other user created. And we don't want that to happen, right? Because this is a personal note taking application. So we'll create a test two at gmail.com. Confirm the account, log in. And remember, this is a new user. And I go to notes and I can see the notes that the test user created. And this is not what we want because we want to have, be able to store data that is uh, only ours and only be able to view our own data. So that's something we have to change. So fortunately, out of the box, uh, Visual Studios also provides functionality to easily do this. So the first thing we're going to do is add the following line of code. So the user class in identity framework is called identity user. So the actual uh, user who we are is stored as identity user. And that could be used as a unique identifier to identify us. The next thing we have to change is over here. I kept notes to, in order to do this a little bit faster. Um, we'll have to specify in our application DB context. Um, this is a very important file, but I'm not gonna go into the specifics of what it does in this particular lecture, because it might be a little bit too, too confusing. But basically, we'll have to change this into identity DB context, uh, angle bracket, identity user. And this is basically inheriting from this class. And we're basically telling, um, giving the database access class, which this is used to represent our database, extra information that it needs. But don't think too much about that because that's a little bit uh, 
too complex for uh, this particular lecture. And next, what we're gonna do is go to our notes controller and pass in the following. User manager, identity user. What user manager is, is it's actually an object that allows us to more quickly um, access user information and it manages our users. So this is like, uh, as I mentioned before, there are libraries and the different libraries offer additional functionality. This is for accessing the current user. But this might be a little bit confusing. I don't have enough time to explain it currently. However, uh, this video will be recorded and uh, there are more comp there are more detailed videos and tutorials online on my YouTube channel that go into more detail about this. And next we'll just do the following. We're going to change the index. So first we're going to get the user ID of the current user. We need to store. We have to gain access to the user manager by error code. So basically what I'm doing is creating the ability to access this and we go to our notes and we say where user ID is equal to uh, the current user that's logged in and says there's no context called notes. Okay. And so basically with those lines, what we did is add the ability very quickly with those few lines of code in order to restrict access to a particular user. Okay, and let me check my notes. Okay. And I think that is it. And we'll add something in that you won't understand currently because I don't think most people have dealt too much with the code. But this should do it and we'll add a new uh, migration because we made changes to our model that represents our data. And we're generating the code to update our database. And now, we will only be able to see the actual, oh no, there's one more thing that has to be changed. So as you can see here, we made it so that you can only see the actual notes that you created. But in our create, our create action of the note, we're not actually storing the user ID. So to our note dot user ID, we had to set it to the user ID. And then it's saved. So now what will happen is that it's automatically going to restrict the notes 
to the actual users that we that created it. So if we click on notes, we're not going to see any notes because the previous notes that were created were not assigned with the user. We create a new note. Note two. Okay. And then create it. So now we have a note and we can see that as test at gmail.com. Now, if we log in as the second user, test two, then log in and go to notes. We will not be able to see the note that test user created. So we'll create another note. Okay, so we have a title note and that's only visible to test two and test one user will only be able to see the note it created, which is not title, I think it was uh, note two. So there you have it. We, in, I think, 16 minutes, we have created a note-taking application that allows us to not only log in and register new users, but create notes, edit notes, and delete notes, as well as restrict the notes you use to being only the notes um, you created. Are there any questions? We can go into more detail. Uh, on the functionality if uh, you want to get more into the code right now. I, I just sort of sped that up in order to avoid confusion. But if there's anything you guys got stuck on, now time to ask. Hello? Uh, a quick question. Um, okay. Um, why, um, when you updated the Node class, you did a migration uh, for, uh, for the... Um, uh, like user, we didn't do a migration for Node the second time, even though you updated the class. Um, uh, the first time, uh, what do you mean uh, so when I added it? Uh, first migration, I think, for, if I, not, you added a string user ID, but you did, I don't think you ran another migration to update the database, did you? Uh, yes, I actually ran the migration after creating the user ID. Uh, okay, I see. Okay. So if we actually look at the data, uh, which would actually be a good idea. Uh, and uh, trying to find out where it is. So. Well, the database is here, but I'm not, oh, there it is. So if we look at the data for notes, now we have the following column. As you can see, we have the notes associated with the user ID. So these are specifying what user created the user ID uh, and, in our table. Um, and, oh, sorry. Uh, furthermore, right. In, right. for every migration uh, that was created in the data slash migrations folder, you can actually see the code and the files that represent the changes made to the database. So uh, we have two uh, functions in these uh, files the up function and the down function. The up function is the changes that are made. And if you want to revert those changes, the down function will remove uh, the changes from that migration. So you can actually go forward as well as backward. That's one of the cool things about uh, entity framework and the auto generation of the migrations. It takes care of that for you automatically without you having to worry about that. In many cases at many companies, they actually have a DevOps team that does this using other tools. But this is this could be handled on the coder side. Um, That's pretty neat. Uh, so that way you have your scripts. If you want to replicate the database in like in a production, you can use these scripts. Yep, exactly. And that's yeah. automatically created. Uh, 
Another thing that I didn't delve into too much are these files. So the app settings file we looked at briefly, and this contains configuration information. The program file is basically the first file that starts, that fires off the other uh, files uh, when your application starts up. And you rarely will ever work with this particular file. So this starts off the web server. And then the startup file, which is a very important file that we haven't dealt with, but in reality, when you're coding applications, you will deal with it. This config contains all your configurations. As you can see, it has configurations for the service of identity uh, framework, as well as entity framework. And it's doing that all for us. Uh, but if you wanted to add additional functionality like logging or uh, uh, global error handling, this is where you would do it. Uh, this is also where you would configure something called middleware, which makes your life a lot easier. What middleware is, is basically a bit of code that runs whenever you make a request to a web page. So you can have that in one place rather than many. So um, it has our services as well as our configurations. And another thing we looked at briefly which I think we have a little bit of time to talk about is the application DB context. So as I mentioned before, the note, the models represent the data you're storing. The application DB context, what this does is say which notes are actually tables. And whenever you're accessing your database, this is a more advanced concept and you have to work with it uh, a bit to really understand it. I remember when I first started um, seeing this coming from other programming languages and web development technologies, I was a bit confused by it, but it's actually really simple. So not all models will be created as tables unless you specify them to be created as tables in your application DB context. This is basically um, the class that represents your database and you access your database through this. Um, and then the identity framework core uh, code is all created in your areas page, in your areas folders. So if you wanted to do any additional changes to uh, the login pages or modify it or add functionality to it, you would modify the pages in here. Uh, the controllers, as I said, each of these actions map to a particular CSHTML file, which is basically what you view in your browser. Like uh, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, so in the nodes controller, uh, you passed something to the constructor. So was, was that like, I, I have a rough idea. Was, was that uh, dependency injection? And yes, was that that's coming? dependency injection. So if you see over here, um, the use, so whenever you pass something into a controller in identity framework, I'm not, not an identity framework, in uh, .NET Core using the MVC architecture, you can use dependency injection to automatically say, uh, associate with this particular object, the context, or so associate with this uh, uh, user manager, uh, an object that's automatically initialized. So it's not empty, it's automatically generated. And in order to specify how it's generated, that would be specified in your actual uh, startup.cs file, the, the, the parameters for dependency injection. Does that make sense? I, I don't want to get too much into how the dependency injection would be set up, because that right. might get a little bit confusing. Yeah, this is enough for now, but it makes sense. Uh, yeah. and. Um, yeah, it's relatively easy to build out um, applications using this particular uh, framework. So I just wanted to give sort of an introduction to it uh, because I find that at a lot of companies I've worked for, they tend to build out the authentication and authorization for their applications themselves when you could really just use this framework in order to have a lot of it done for you because frameworks make our lives easier, right? Um, Basically, by using a framework, we're using, and you know how to use it, you basically have a lot of stuff built out for you. And not just the stuff that you need currently, 
but requirements that you might need in the future. Examples are Facebook authentication, multi-part authentication or integration with third-party solutions. All that's taken care of. You just got to configure the actual framework and suddenly you'll be able to log in with Facebook or Google or uh, Instagram. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what's great about it. Um, and, and that's it. Do uh, you guys got any more questions? Uh, I know this might have been a little bit uh, overwhelming. I feel like I got too much into the code. I wanted to avoid that. But at least the first part of the actual uh, lecture with regards to the auto generation features of Visual Studios for generating an application is pretty straightforward. Furthermore, the amount of code we ran was very limited. I think we wrote uh, less than 15 lines of code. Uh, the rest was uh, created for us, probably less than 10 lines. And we have an application in 16 minutes that uh, takes notes for us. So that's just an indication of how fast you could develop data-driven applications using this technology, which can be used in many contexts, right? Because there's uh, probably in your everyday work, whether you're in technology or not, there are uh, there is information you have to save and uh, you could utilize by having it stored. Another good thing about uh, these websites is that they're responsive. Uh, what that means is they automatically restructure based on the browser length size. So if you're viewing it on your phone, you'll be able to view it on your phone and it'll show a, a website that could be viewed on your phone without you having to uh, build out a separate website for it. And that's all taken care of for you. Yeah, and that, that's it. That's, that's, that's the introductory lecture. Uh, I, I hope there are questions. I'm gonna, I'll check the chat box. Um, now's the time to ask. I will also, oh, is the controller responsible for handling HTTP requests? RESTful API. So the REST is, a, is an actual architecture. Um, and if you look at it on Google, uh, it actually stands, is, it's basically for integrating different systems. But let me show you. But the REST actually stands for something. Uh, so you, you specify what are get operations, stuff like that. In Visual Studios, you're not making I guess you could say it's for handling HTTP requests. Yeah, you're right. Uh, but you wouldn't be accessing it directly. So like you can't make a call to it um, from another application. So whenever you're accessing a view, um, it would pass back the view. In the RESTful uh, architecture, you're actually passing back the data. So you'd be passing back JSON. Uh, I'm not sure if that made sense, Mark. So basically, here you're passing back the actual, you're making calls to pass back the actual um, page you're viewing. With the RESTful API, if you're using it, you usually have two separate applications. You have the backend application, which is the RESTful API, which passes back pure data uh, and nothing structural or anything else about it. And then there'll be a front end application that's built in Angular or uh, uh, React. And that would take care of the rendering of the information in different forms. And by using the RESTful application, you're minimizing the work on the back end with regards to rendering of information and passing that off to the front end application. Did, did that make sense, Amar? So this isn't actually a RESTful architecture, uh, but it does handle HTTP requests. So whenever you're making a request to see a particular page, um, it's going to hit this particular function and it's going to say what view to return. Um, and if you don't specify that, it'll return the default view via, rather, via the associations um, and do any processing you require. A any other questions, folks? Um, I, you could also ask them on YouTube channel. Uh, as I said previously, there are uh, video tutorials that go into a lot more detail with regards to that. I have a question actually. Okay. Okay. So 
if you look in the um, just I just while I was talking to uh, we were doing the course. I, if you browse through the uh, MST and um, documentation, mm -hmm. so um, they instead of I action result like for the API documentation, they say there's something called action results um, type of key, you know. So when they say like, this is maybe the newer way where instead of saying like, okay, and the inside they're returning the object, they return the object directly. So why um, uh, the MVC doesn't use that? Like, so should I, uh, do, you remember, do you remember how you mentioned uh, dependency injection? Yes, yes. Um, so I, whenever you have I in front of the actual class name, it stands for interface, right? So an interface is basically defines the structure mm -hmm. of the actual um, class that's being passed in. Mm -hmm. So um, because we're using I action result here, okay. we could pass an action result and it'll accept it. We could pass in anything that inherits um, I action result because I action result just defines the structure. Okay, got it. So that way by loosely coupling it, we can swap it out with something else. So if there's another class that you create with slightly different functionality from action result uh, that you want to use instead, you can change, you can associate it separately, differently in the startup.cs, and it'll automatically change what is passed in here for all everywhere in your code. So it makes for less changes, more maintainable, and faster changes. That's that's the theory behind it. Did that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, folks? If not, I guess we'll call it for today. I also wanted to mention, uh, I'm looking for feedback in order to improve these meetups and the lectures, because I'm trying to develop them into being more uh, user-friendly. So um, I have a link to give away a free military-grade pen. All you have to do is pay for shipping, and it's very cheap. The value is around $60. You can get it for like a... Uh, 14, I believe. I don't remember the price exactly. That's just shipping and handling. It duels as a knife, flashlight, pen, and can opener. Uh, I'll send you the link. All you have to do is fill out the form, uh, the Google form. I'll post the link in the actual chat box for all the links that I mentioned. Just give me feedback and I'll improve it so that other people can benefit from your feedback. And if you have any questions with regards to coding uh, or the actual uh, um, stuff that I covered here, just uh, send me an email and I will uh, be more than happy to help you out. I'm also thinking of starting a bootcamp, taking on five uh, people that are interested in coding and I'll, I'm putting together the curriculum and uh, uh, refining it through these meetups, but for anyone that's interested in transitioning into a web development role or just learning web development to a degree where you can build something that could, uh, you can use to replace your job, uh, um, uh, feel free to contact me. So I want to take on five students to like attempt to refine this curriculum and train them for free. So just send me an email, just so you're aware. I posted the links um, in the chat box and I'll also be posting them in the meetup group. I, I hope that was helpful. Have a great day, guys. I'll call it for now and I'm gonna end up the meetup, unless you have any more questions. Nope, if not, I will talk to you folks later. Have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Goodbye.